Okay. So uh, welcome to this Academic Integrity Week workshop on successful and ethical exam writing. My name is Ruth Silverman and I'm a Learning Services Coordinator at the Student Learning Commons. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that SFU sits on the land of the Coast Salish people. I think whenever, wherever you are, if you're in the Lower Mainland, you are on the land of the Coast Salish people. And at the Burnaby campus, we're on the land of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Katsi, and Coquitlam nations specifically. Um, so <laughs> it was a bit of a challenge this term um, to know like what actually is going on with exams. So um, I have versions of this workshop that are specifically for the remote situation. Um, I had assumed that I, you know, if we were going back in person, I would be able to go back to exclusively talking about uh, in-person exams, but it seems like that's not necessarily happening even for in-person courses. So can you put in the chat, like what you're experiencing with your upcoming exams? Um, so, you know, if it, if it stays just the two of you, it'll help me focus my remarks. Okay, so Brianna has both. That seems to be pretty typical. And Emily's are all in person. Okay, so I guess I will address both, um, but maybe, you know, say more about a person. And I guess the other question is, um, I guess this is really just for Brianna, is, is it your first time writing online exams in post-secondary or were we, you with us for that wonderful experimentation last year with online exams? It's the first time, okay. Okay, so then that really helps me gauge how much detail I get into. Thanks. Okay, so we'll talk about, you know, first setup. Um, and the setup question mostly applies to remote exams, um, because you don't necessarily control the setup when you're going to an in person exam. Um, we'll get into a bit of preparation, just general preparation strategies, um, and maybe quantitative strategies. Uh, do either of you have quantitative exams coming up? Because um, if not, and no one else shows up, we could probably skip over that part. Um, so like any math, physics, uh, statistics, that kind of exam. Emily doesn't. I'm not seeing a response from Brianna, um, but I will, oh, okay. Oh, Brianna has dogs. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you have any quantitative exams coming up, like math, stats, physics, that kind of thing, because if not, I can skip that part. Okay, philosophy 110. Yeah, that one is like symbolic logic. So it's kind of quantitative. Um, right. And then we're going to talk about exam anxiety, managing time on exams. That is pretty universal. Um, and multiple choice. Um, I forgot to say essay exams uh, and open book exams. So um, could you just also both put in the chat if there are any of those that you don't have? so that we can um, possibly skip over them if, if neither of you has them. So it's like multiple choice essay exams or open book exams. Okay, so Brianna doesn't think she has any multiple choice, but Emily does. Okay, so basically I'll cover everything. <laughs> Yeah, and this just really shows the diversity of what's going on. Um, so the first task really for preparing is to inform yourself about what to expect, which is 
exactly what I've been doing in the context of this workshop. Because um, it, it, it is really challenging as an SFU staff to um, provide workshops about exams when everything is changing so rapidly and not being a student, I, I just, you know, I don't have firsthand exposure to what's going on. So I do appreciate you letting me know. Um, so, you know, just like the general details about, you know, when and where, uh, and if it is a new location to you, if it's in person, um, scope it out beforehand so that you don't get lost on the day of. Um, how long is the exam going to be? That's a, you know, a good thing to know, um, but also the timing. So um, if you have online multiple choice, which I don't think either of you do, let me just look back in the chat. Um, so Emily, you have multiple choice, but yours are all in person and it doesn't look like Brianna does. So that's, that's a whole section I can skip for online multiple choice. Um, Cause that's a bit of a different beast where sometimes you get like a question, um, you can only answer one question at a time. Um, you can't, you know, skip around and it, you know, and, and sometimes each question is timed if you're doing it online, but sounds like that is not a factor for you, which is good because I don't think it's pedagogically sound. Um, you wanna know the format. Uh, because practicing with questions in the same format as you're going to get on the exam is really one of the best ways to prepare. So, um, you know, it's great if you're doing some practice testing, but if you're practicing with a bunch of, um, you know, say short answer questions and it turns out you do have multiple choice, then it's kind of of limited value. Um, you want to know what materials are allowed. Um, and that is an important academic integrity consideration. Like I would, I would assume that students who are conscientious enough to come to this workshop would not be intentionally cheating at all. Um, but sometimes, you know, particularly in an open book situation, uh, particularly if you're at home and, um, you know, there's no invigilator to take a look at what you have with you. Um, if you're not really clear about what is allowed and what's not allowed, then, you know, you could run into trouble by looking at something that was not authorized, um, even if it's just kind of by mistake. Um, so open book exams are a little bit tricky um, because that term can mean different things. So um, some professors mean that it's okay to look at the textbook and your notes. Some people would include Canvas in that, some people wouldn't. Um, some professors, you know, are just like, well, as long as you don't use a cheating service or, you know, or another person, then uh, it's okay to go anywhere to Google anything. So it's really good to know specifically what's allowed and what's not. Mm. Okay, so if you have a remote exam, um, these are some setup considerations just in general. Um, so go somewhere quiet. Um, if you're going to be writing it from home, say, uh, and you have roommates or you have family members, um, talk to them, like let them know, maybe put a sign on your door, you know, let them know in advance where, when you're going to be writing the exam and ask them to kind of help you out, you know, so like, don't disturb me during that time. Um, if there's, you know, somebody needs to be buzzed up to our apartment, could you listen for it? Um, could you please, you know, if, if there's uh, issues with the number of people streaming and the strength of your Wi-Fi, uh, where you are, you know, ask them not to do some streaming at that time, you know, and, and all that, like that can be very useful. Um, you know, have anything that you're allowed to use right next to you. Uh, and that would include the professor or TA's contact information. And the reason that I'm throwing that in is uh, in case there are technical difficulties during the exam, I have heard some horror stories from students who have had technical difficulties during the exam. You know, so really, if that happens, you want to be taking screenshots um, and you want to, you know, get in touch with your professor or TA right away and let them know. Um, so, you know, not having a delay while you're looking up their information. Um, so, yeah, I mean, have your computer fully charged, 
the pop pop up blockers off. I mean, unless the exam is going to come as a pop up for some reason. Uh, if there's any extra hardware or software that you need. Um, and your Wi Fi is strong. Make sure you don't have any temptations or distractions in your environment. So leave your phone away. Um, don't have other tabs open in your browser. Um, you know, and especially not something like Canvas that you could cheat off of. Um, have your notes and your book in another room if you're not allowed to consult it. Um, you know, so like that's very important for academic integrity. Um, because sometimes, um, even if you're not intending to cheat, it can be kind of tempting if, if the thing is right next to you. Um, so I actually, as an instructor, I had a question from a student that alerted me to this dilemma. Um, the student was saying that even though like they have an in-person class right before the class they're in with me, um, on the midterm date, they have to write it remotely, and he'd prefer to write it remotely from home. So he was saying he would have to miss my class so that he could write the midterm from home. Um, and I was suggesting, well, you know, is there any way you could write it from campus? And that made me sort of think that, geez, there must be like a lot of students that might be looking to write exams remotely on campus, which can be incredibly awkward. Um, so I have these suggestions, um, you know, maybe looking for some empty classrooms that are empty during the block uh, and, you know, scout it out in advance. So, you know, if your midterm is like two Tuesdays from now at 2.30, um, scout locations next Tuesday at 2.30. Um, I understand there's a lot of classrooms in the AQ that are empty at certain periods of time. Um, for example, uh, you'd also want to test your Wi-Fi in the room that you're in to make sure you've got a strong Wi-Fi signal. I know in um, well, this actually, I don't know this because my knowledge is from years ago, but I used to teach in Robert C. Brown and there were Wi-Fi issues in Robert C. Brown. Um, so, you know, you just want to be really careful about where you would go. Um, so like there's the possibility of um, writing the exam in the library in a silent space or a quiet space. Um, so here at Burnaby campus, uh, the, the fifth floor is quiet, the sixth floor is silent. Um, you might want to book some group study rooms through the library, uh, although you have to book, you can book no more than two weeks in advance. So you might have to kind of jump on it um, if your exam's coming up in two weeks, I, I would imagine they'd be really in demand. So. Theoretically, they are only supposed to be for one, um, two or more students, but I understand that in this situation, um, the library is being pretty lenient about enforcing those things. Um, I saw in the sub, they have these chairs that are like kind of like upholstery cut into a wall. They're kind of like a cubby or something. And I, I wonder if that might be a bit of a uh, more, you know, less distracting location if you have to, even though they're in a, a big room. Um, there's a nap room in the sub, so that room is guaranteed to be quiet, but I'm not sure if you're even allowed to do any other silent type activity there. Um, and then I just got a message right before the statutory holiday on Wednesday that SFU has designated some remote learning classrooms um, on the Burnaby campus. And I have those on the next slide. And those are specifically for people in remote classes. Um, I'm not sure how great they'd be for exams though, because there are probably people there that are you know, actually attending class. Um, presumably they'd have a headset on so that the noise doesn't travel, but um, you know, they might be wanting to sometimes participate in class and say something. So I, you know, I don't really know if that would be great, but um, I can give you the information on the next slide. And um, also just recommend noise canceling headphones if you do end up having to write an exam from a semi-public space. So I copied this list from the SFU website of the remote learning classrooms. Um, you know, even if you don't think it's a great idea to write exams there, um, this is good information if you have to take remote classes from campus. 
And um, if you want, you can take a screenshot of the URL so that um, you can check back later. Okay, so aside from logistical considerations, now we're getting into the part that is um, really relevant, no matter, you know, if it's an in-person exam or a remote exam or whatever it is. Um, so this study that I cite on the slide is um, where they compared a whole bunch of study strategies, I think about 10 common study strategies that students use. And um, they compared other pieces of research over the last 20 years before 2013. And um, that, you know, in total, they had thousands of participants. And they were looking to see if there are any study strategies that are pretty much guaranteed to work no matter the situation. So, you know, if it's a math class or a history class, you know, if it's in elementary school or if it's in graduate school, you know, these, these study strategies that they identified um, are very good bets to work for you. And one of them is to study consistently. I mean, it says every day, um, you know, maybe not every single day, but instead of um, cramming like for a day or two before the test, it works much better to space it out and, you know, at least a good few times a week, um, all term, do the studying. Um, and planning the study time in advance helps because then you're more likely to be able to do a little bit every day to find the time, you know, being intentional about finding the time in your busy lives. And if you're not cramming, it helps you get a good night's sleep. Um, I think one of the biggest things that people do to sabotage themselves when exams are coming up is sacrifice sleep for study time um, because you need your sleep to be able to, um, the first thing is problem solving ability. So for that philosophy 110 course, for sure, um, I've talked to math professors who say that problem solving ability is the first thing to go if you don't get enough sleep, but also memory goes, concentration goes, you know, all these things that you need um, to successfully write an exam are not gonna be present if you don't have a good night's sleep. Um, so, Another thing is uh, to form study groups and study partners. That can really help. Um, so even if it's people that aren't in your class, um, if you're somebody who needs some motivation and accountability, then um, working with a group of students, like dedicated students, like you have to choose wisely, right? But um, if you're with another student who's very disciplined and working on their work, then it's more likely to motivate you to do that. Um, and if it is students in your class, you've got to make sure that uh, the study group is operating ethically. Um, it can be like an excellent idea to have a study group um, who, you know, to share your ideas about like what you think that the professor is going to emphasize on the exams, because you might have your own ideas, your own ideas might be wrong, but if you're in a group of four or five students and you know, you're thinking one thing and they're thinking something else, then that might help you um, to get on the right track with the material that you really emphasize. Um, and also like the ability to quiz each other, um, you know, with some knowledge of what's going on in the class can be really, really useful. Um, but, you know, sometimes there's a bit of ethical blur or, you know, a bit of an ethical line that could be crossed. Um, and uh, the situation is um, sometimes if a professor will distribute a bunch of essay questions in advance and say, okay, two of these 10 questions are going to be on the test. Um, so, you know, thinking of writing 10 essays in preparation for the test, that could be kind of overwhelming. Um, so there might be the temptation to split it among group members. And um, I think if you're thinking of doing that, it's probably good to check with the professor um, as to whether that's permitted. Um, I think in a closed book situation, it might be okay because ultimately you're in there by yourself writing it. And um, you know, if, if somebody else in your study group has written an essay and you've read it, I mean, you're not gonna be like memorizing it completely. So it, it might just be kind of a way to 
be efficient about preparation. Um, but definitely check with the professor, but definitely in an open book exam, you know, you don't want to be sitting there with a bunch of essays written out by other people that you're prepared to just copy. Um, like that would definitely be over the ethical line. Um, so, I mean, I would say that if the professor distributes, you know, 10 questions and says two of these are going to be on the exam, a good way to approach it is probably by um, writing outlines for all of them, you know, just kind of like planning out, okay, I'm going to, you know, hit this topic first, and then I will hit this, and then I will hit that, if this is the essay that comes up on the test. Um, so let's get back to the question of planning out your studies. Um, there is a YouTube video uh, that really goes over how to prepare an exam prep inventory. Uh, and you can take a screenshot of this if you want to watch the video, but I can, I can also cover it. Um, so do both of you um, have uh, like a study schedule or um, some sort of planner that you use? Uh, weekly schedule. Yeah, Emily does. And Brianna's dogs might be barking. Yeah. So I think, I think, um, okay, so Brianna has kind of a, a messy schedule, uh, which I think is better than no schedule. So I, I mean, a lot of people, when they're planning out their studies, they will, you know, put some study blocks for the tests in their schedule. So I think that's a good step. But I think an even better step is to do an exam prep inventory first. So um, you want to list the different things that are going to be covered on the exam that can come from your syllabus. Um, and then, you know, the second one where you're inventorying, if you have all the materials, like, that's okay. Um, but if you're pretty confident of that, you could probably skip that step. Um, but you notice that a couple of the topics by the materials, there are asterisks. And that has to do with knowledge gaps. Um, those are topics for one reason or another that you're not, um, you're not that confident in. And that signals that you need to maybe spend more time on those topics and assign it a higher studying priority. So that would be columns three and four. Um, in column three, you're estimating how much time you're going to need to study for each of the subsections and then totaling it. And that hopefully will give you a more accurate estimate than if you just sort of think, um, oh, how long do I think I'm going to need? And I'm going to put that amount of time in my schedule. Um, I think it would be a lot more accurate. I think people tend to um, underestimate how long they're going to need to prepare for an exam. And that tends to um, be one of the reasons why cramming is so prevalent. And um, sometimes people overestimate. And I was an overestimator. I was one of these, you know, kind of anxious students. And I would just, you know, I had a test coming up and I would almost inevitably think, wow, this is going to take forever. It's going to be impossible. <laughs> you know, like I'd be overwhelmed by the amount of time that I would think it would take. And that would lead to procrastination. So if I had gone through um, subject by subject and tried to accurately estimate how much time, I might not have been so overwhelmed. Like if I had done it, you know, well enough in advance, I had seen that it, I thought it was going to take 13 hours. That's a lot of time. But you know, if it's if you figure that out enough in advance, you can schedule that time. It's not that big a deal. Um, the other thing about estimating how much time each section will take is to allow about one and a half times your initial estimate. So building in some buffer time there. Um, and the priority levels that you're assigning um, is to make sure that, you know, instead of necessarily, you know, studying in the order of when the lectures occurred, unless um, it's something like math where the information like builds on the previous information. But if it's kind of discrete information, like it's a, you know, a survey course um, or a theory course where every, you know, lecture or chapter is a different theory, um, you can jump around and it's much better to jump around starting 
with the topics that you find most um, challenging, you know, that you're not as confident about, and the ones that the professor seems to have emphasized. Um, so those would be the A priorities, those would be the ones that you would study first and make sure that they were covered. Um, whereas what topics that the professor did not seem to emphasize, you know, and or topics that you're really confident in, maybe you learned about in another class or something. Um, you know, yeah, you should look them over if there's time. But if you leave them to the end, and you run out of time on them, then it's not really so serious. So I think that's a really good planning step. Um, so I had said, you know, not only spacing out, you know, say, say you're planning to space out your exam studying over the course of a week. I mean, that's, that's pretty good. Um, that's not cramming, but even before the exam period hits, like even from the very beginning of the semester, um, it will really help you succeed on exams. If you review the information frequently, like, you know, reviewing your lectures um, or your readings within 24 hours of learning it. And then every week, every 10 days, you know, or something, pulling out the lecture, trying to reconstruct as much as you can in your brain uh, before looking at the notes and, and then, you know, reviewing the notes. Um, and the reason is this curve of forgetting, that's the black curve. So here is when you've learned the information, like either from reading or from lecture, um, you know, so you've covered all of it. Uh, but if you don't review within 24 hours, then you're not putting the information into long term memory and um, you lose about half of it within the first 24 hours. And then if you just put your notebook away. Um, you lose more and more and more and more. And by the time you get to the midterm about a month later you know, I don't know, 5%, 3%, you know, very little of the information will immediately be able to come to mind. And that can, um, that's, you know, one of the biggest explanations about why cramming is so ineffective, um, because you think you're studying, but really you're relearning everything, and that's going to take a lot longer than you think it will. Um, so yeah, that's not a good idea. Uh, whereas if you move it into your long term memory by reviewing it in, you know, the first day after you've initially learned it, um, your memory is going to be restored. And then if you keep reviewing throughout the term, um, you're on this curve, your memory is always hovering between 80 and 100%. Um, the more you review, the less time it takes because you're more familiar. So you can just sort of look at a word and all the associated knowledge will come to mind. Um, and you, you're just sort of continually reconstructing your memory. So memory of the material is not gonna be an issue going into you know, the week or so that you've set aside to study. Um, you're already at about 80%. Uh, and that's, that's really important, um, even for open book exams, because for an open book exam, theoretically, you could look things up. But they're usually designed to be at a much higher level and uh, to for time to be a constraint um, because the professor really doesn't want people to have time to look a bunch of stuff up. So you still want to really remember it. So if you're kind of between 80 and 100% of memory going into the week or so before exams, and I'm saying a week, but you know it, it could be even better, it might be two weeks or 10 days or something. Um, so what do you do? Uh, you practice with questions for that period, you know, because you've already, you already remember it. Um, you don't have to keep like rereading or anything like that to remember it. Um, so that study I referred to from 2013 um, was saying that other than distributed practice, the other universally effective way to study for exams is by uh, practice testing. Um, and that is supported by a lot of subsequent research as well. Um, and I think everybody knows that if it's like a math exam, um, you know, if you remember your high school math exams, probably you prepared by solving a bunch of problems. But um, it even works for, you know, like I was talking about practice questions um, in essay format, right? If you practice writing outlines and thinking through the thought processes, 
um, that will really, really help um, anticipate, you know, and if, if, if questions are not distributed, you can anticipate what would make a good essay question. And a lot of what will make a good essay question um, are questions about relationships between concepts that you've learned in different parts of the course. Those tend to be at the level of analysis on this pyramid. Um, and that's where you get kind of the compare and contrast types of questions where you need to um, break different concepts down and talk about relationships. That's a very common one. Um, the level of analysis can be tested on multiple choice as well, you know, so it's also very useful to anticipate and practice with multiple choice questions. Um, so an analysis question might be where you have two closely related concepts that are among the choices um, given. And only one of them is right, but you have to um, be able to break down the concepts well enough to notice fine distinctions. Um, so practicing with questions is really, really important. But if you um, are only practicing with memorization questions, it's not going to be so effective. So those are at the lowest level of this learning pyramid. Um, and it's necessary to remember things, obviously, to be able to move up the pyramid, but it's not sufficient just to study for memory. So if you are always making up questions about, you know, definitions of things um, or examples, like the same examples that you were given in class, uh, and you're just memorizing those examples, um, then that's only going to take you so far. Um, it's better to also prepare for application questions, analysis questions, and evaluation questions on a test. Um, application questions usually are where you're um, asked to apply course concepts to a new example. Uh, maybe there's a scenario given. Um, or on an exam, there's like just sort of a short example and it asks, you know, what is this an example of? Um, or you're, um, you're given, you know, say a concept in the question stem and it asks you, you know, which of these examples is the correct example of this concept. Um, and yeah, an analysis level we talked about, um, evaluation level, I think those will, will appear, you know, quite a bit, especially on um, open book exams, because like a, you know, a regular university exam is going to be fairly high level open book exams, since you have all the information, you know, they're really going to go for high level questions. Um, and those are the type of questions where, say, you're asked to compare and contrast, you know, a few different course concepts or theories. Um, and then you're at, you know, you're given an example and then you're supposed to say, you know, which of these theories best explains this example, you know, so it's, it's pretty complex. Um, so if you develop questions or you find questions to practice with, um, this is something you could be looking for all term as you do your readings, as you sit in lecture, you know, thinking about concepts that are kind of complex and interrelated, making up your own examples um, for concepts, you know, so that you're prepared for new examples and application questions. That can be really useful. Um, and if you have developed some of your own questions and you have a study group, you can ask your study group to do the same thing throughout the term um, and exchange questions with each other. Okay. So um, I'm just going to kind of quickly go through this for Brianna. Um, the thing about preparing for quantitative exams is that sometimes people will do like a lot of questions that they find easy, you know, they're, and they, and sometimes people just kind of ignore the questions um, that they have trouble doing, you know, so they think, oh, okay, I've been able to do, you know, 23 out of 25 of these problems, I should be fine for the exam, but it tends to be the more challenging ones that you're given on the exam. 
Um, so when you know you're not in some sort of high stakes situation like an exam, you need to practice struggling through the difficult problems um, so that you, you know you feel the discomfort and you're able to get through it, you know, just by like trying things. Um, sometimes you might need to go for help uh, to a TA or a classmate um, and then go back and struggle through it again. Um, so it's important to do problems at all levels of the dif difficulty and, you know, really go through the process of feeling the discomfort of finding something difficult, but being able to work through it. Um, because that's what's going to happen on an exam. And sometimes if you have exam anxiety, um, sometimes that, that's what triggers it is, you know, not being able to deal with the discomfort of um, a difficult problem if you've always just kind of pushed it aside when you've been doing homework. Um, it's also important um, to, you know, like a lot of textbooks for quantitative are organized according to, you know, the concept. Um, you know, so I, I can't, I did take symbolic logic and I actually loved that class, but I really can't remember what some of the headings would be. But, you know, probably you're encountering um, proofs under a bunch of headings in your textbook. So the headings give away what you're gonna have to do to solve that problem. And if that's the only source of your practice, um, then when you get to the exam and there are no headings and there are all different types of questions mixed up, it can be, you know, very confusing. So you need to practice with mixed problem sets, you know, with different types of problems without headings giving it away. Um, and this one, I don't know. I mean, it refers to um, a, a web page that you can look at to learn more about this, but I think it probably applies more to uh, quest to you know, courses like math. Um, yeah, so it's, it's when, you know, you get to the exam and the problem looks like something you've never seen before, <laughs> but really it's one of these common ways the professors use to disguise easy problems. So I'm not gonna go over it in great detail, but if you think that might happen, you can uh, take a screenshot of this URL. and nobody's taking any math exams. Um, exam anxiety. So um, is, this, is this an issue for either of you? I mean, this would, be in, this would be useful to know how much detail I should go into about this. Not really. <clears throat> Maybe a little, okay. Yeah, so I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, but a lot of students will say that uh, that they have exam anxiety and that that interferes with their performance. Um, and sometimes it has to do with a lack of preparation. Sometimes it's more than that. Um, so the basics that you would do is, you know, making sure that you feel really prepared and that takes you know, by using the study strategies I talked about, and that takes care of like a lot of the students that think they have exam anxiety. Um, but also like doing things in your life um, to deal with the stress hormones in your body, uh, such as getting a good night's sleep, um, having an exercise routine to bust your stress, uh, proper nutrition. Oh, we are being joined by somebody else. <laughs> cool. Um, you know, and, and not like over relying on caffeine and sugar and that kind of thing that a lot of people do um, consume a lot of around exams because those things actually increase the anxiety in your body. Um, another thing is positive self-talk. So, um, you know, like I said, I was kind of, I don't think I actually had exam anxiety, but I had, you know, maybe subclinical anxiety about my studies. And um, I would, you know, I would tend to get overwhelmed. I would tend to be, you know, negative self-talk like, oh, this is going to take forever. I should have started earlier. Um, you know, I'm going to fail. I, you know, I would send myself those kinds of messages. So you want to kind of reality test those messages, um, you know, by 
saying, you know, like, I'm going to fail. Okay, well, was there a time when you thought you were going to fail, but you actually did really well? And, you know, and in my case, there were many times that I thought I was going to fail. And sometimes I even got A's or something, um, you know, so, th so that's a good one to remind you of. And then, you know, and then you can say, well, you know, for your previous exams where you thought you were going to fail and then you ended up do doing really well, you know, what, what made the difference? And, you know, and usually it was um, spending a lot of time and having good study strategies and, you know, doing practice questions and things like that. Um, you know, and so so sometimes you can kind of just talk yourself out of it. Um, but there are definitely students that, you know, no matter how much they prepare, they still um, have some debilitating anxiety around exams. And uh, I would suggest like watching this video, you can take a screenshot of the URL. Um, you know, that's a good starting point. Uh, if you know, no matter how prepared you are, you know, sometimes you go blank on exams, that kind of thing. Um, I'd say to work with health and counseling services, that's a really good starting point. Um, and, you know, and if it, if it does end up being diagnosed as an anxiety disorder, the Center for Accessible Learning can help. Okay, so managing time in exams. This comes at a time that I'm realizing that I'm not managing my time in the workshop that well. Um, so it may go a bit over. And if you do need to leave um, at 20 after that, that's fine because um, it will be going on the SLC website, um, the recording. So, you know, these are some general ideas uh, about how to manage your time in any exam. So, um, you know, looking at the whole exam originally and, you know, realizing, okay, it's, you know, this many hours, it's worth this many points, you know, and then you do the math and you realize how much time you, need, you, you can spend per point. Um, also like doing the easy questions first, you know, so this is all kind of conventional wisdom. Um, you should have seen my exam booklets when I was in university, like it would be like question 14, you know, then question six, then question 1A, then question, you know, three, four, five, then question 1B. I mean, I was jumping all over the place and that that is how I tended to do, you know, pretty well on exams. Um, because, you know, sometimes you find clues in other, you know, like if you look at the multiple choice exams, there may be some clues in there for things that you've forgotten for essays. Um, and sometimes, you know, just like having read the difficult question and having some time that you're spending on something else may um, give you some time just for like your unconscious mind to work on it and you, you know, suddenly know what you're going to write down for that difficult question. Okay, so um, say you're given an exam that has, you know, and you can jump around, uh, and it has some multiple choice questions and some essay and short answer questions. Um, we forgot that I signed up for like a approaching exams oh. something seminar thing okay. so i'm catching the end of it but i think she froze <clears throat> okay so i've muted her because i think um i think she was talking to somebody in her environment okay um yeah so i'm i think i will just you know i'll just let you know what i recommend for that kind of exam if you can jump around in it um is like to read, but not answer the essay questions first so that you you have them in your head and you can look for clues or, you know, or, or allow some time to kind of think of what you want to put. Um, if it's the type that, you, you know, say there are five questions and you choose two of them, make your choices right away and stick with them and only keep those questions in your head. Um, then you just kind of breeze through all of the multiple choice questions because they might contain hints for answering the essay questions um, and answer them quickly as you go along. Um, so only the easy ones, you know, only the ones that you can answer quickly. 
And if you can't answer a question quickly, you know, just indicate, make a mark or something that you need to go back to it um, because it's a waste of time to puzzle over multiple choice. So then you go to the essay or short answer questions because they're worth like way more marks. Um, you answer them as best you can also in order from the easiest one to the most difficult. And then you go back and puzzle over the tricky multiple choice questions. Um, and you know the reason that you kind of leave that till the end is that worst comes to worst, you find that you have like two minutes left. You can just you know quickly randomly bubble things in if you know worst case scenario, as long as you don't lose any marks for wrong answers. Um, so this is, you know, for forced order multiple choice um, questions in an online format. And I know that Emily and Brianna are not going to have those. Um, Miggy, do you have any of those? Like, do you have an online test that's going to be multiple choice and you have to just answer the questions in the order in which they come up? Oh, and she does. Okay, so I'm going to have to, oops, I'm going to have to go over that a little bit. Those are really frustrating. Um, I think a lot of students find them frustrating. Um, and really the only way to approach that is uh, we talked about practice testing. And I think that was around when you came in that, you know, the practicing with questions like the ones on the exam is one of the best ways to prepare. So if you're gonna get a limited amount of time for each question, then you want to practice answering um, multiple choice questions within a limited amount of time as well, so that you can get fast. Um, and to get fast, um, another learning specialist I know suggested like, you know, if you're given a minute per question, don't give yourself a minute when you're practicing, give yourself 45 seconds or so. So, you know, that you, you can, you know, practice answering them even faster than you would have to on the test. And that is really the best way of preparing. Um, another way to prepare to be fast in that situation is just to get to know um, some good strategies for answering multiple choice questions in general. And that also applies, you know, no matter what context the multiple choice exam is. Um, so we'll just kind of quickly go over that. Here is an example of a question, and it's from a web page from University of Toronto. Um, that you can find at the link below. We've linked to it from our website where there's a lot of a lot of strategies. Um, and I would recommend going to it if you are concerned about multiple choice questions. So just take a minute uh, to read over the question. And I actually don't even know the answer to this question, but what, what do you think is the first thing that you would do if you get a question like this on an exam? I'd like, I'd like, um, I'd like to hear from like at least one or two people about their initial strategy for approaching a question like that. And while you're reading, I'll let Miggy know um, that I'm making a recording of this and it's gonna go up within a week or so on the Student Learning Commons website. Uh, and I'll show you where at the end if you're there so you can see what I talked about before you came in. So does anyone have any sort of like a guess about how you would normally approach a question like this? I don't see anybody making a guess. So I, I guess I will just continue. <clears throat> So what I suggest is actually covering up the options. If it's on paper, you know, bring a, a blank piece of paper so you can cover up the options and don't even look at them until you've gotten a good understanding of what the question is asking. 
um, you know, or if it's on the computer and you can't really physically cover it up, just like don't really look at them. So read the question stem. And quite often, um, the question stem will give you an idea of the answer, or you might even instantly kind of know the answer, you know, and then it's just a matter of finding it on the list. Um, if you look too early at the list, that's when people tend to get really confused. Like I think people find, you know, that they get confused between the options a lot on multiple choice, and that tends to be um, a student's greatest challenge for answering it, you know, because if you, if you don't have a really clear idea in your mind about what you're looking for, um, when you look at the options, it's it, it there, there are going to be some that are close together that are more likely to confuse you. But if you have a clear idea, um, or at least a clear idea of a part of it, then you will be a lot better off going through the options. So we'll go back to the original question. Um, in this case, it has to do with, you know, there are kind of two dimensions that the answer is on, you know, so is it increasing your sensitivity like there's faster or slower, and then there's greater sensitivity or less sensitivity. So, I mean, somebody going through this might know what the exact answer is, um, or they might just know, you know, whether it's greater or whether it's less. And, um, you know, that'll at least narrow it down. Okay, so short answer or essay questions. Um, we talked about sticking with your initial choice. I used to lose so much time on exams because I would not stick with my initial choice, which is, you know, can be a huge waste of time. Um, we talked about easiest to most difficult. You might want to bring a highlighter, and that actually could also be useful on multiple choice tests you know so this is if it's on paper um like you would highlight what the instruction is telling you to do on a short answer or an essay um so that like you know for example if it says compare and contrast or analyze then that'll help you keep in mind that they don't just want you to spew out everything you know about the topics um but on multiple choice like a highlighter is where you can highlight keywords like always you know, or not, you know, words that sometimes people go wrong because they ignore them when they're answering the question quickly. Um, and yeah, and basically, you know, if a question is worth um, five marks, you should have five points. It's kind of an indicator of how many points you need to have. Um, so yeah, like, you know, don't be editing yourself while you're writing because that will only slow you down. Um, you know, if by some reason you finish early, which probably you won't, um, if you've given thorough enough answers, uh, you might be able to go back and make some corrections. But, you know, I, I really do not think that professors are marking a lot on spelling, grammar, and things like that when it comes to short answer essay questions. Um, for essay questions, you actually might want to draw an outline um, or a mind map, which is like a visual outline uh, to keep you organized and on point as you write the the question. And you can also ask your professor if you know if you have something down in your outline, but you don't actually get a chance to write about it. You know if it'll count for points because often it will. Um, yeah, and you know, and if you if you're running out of time on an essay question then, you know, just switch to point form, you know, just kind of throw things down as quickly as you can. So open books, open book exams, they tend to have like a lot of short answer or essay questions, um, but like they tend to be even higher level because the professor knows you have all the details like right in front of you. Um, so, if you, you know, write some practice essays or, you know, practice answers or even outlines um, to practice for an open book exam, um, you can ask the professor if you are allowed to have your practice answers with you. Um, or, you know, if they say you can have anything with you, then 
clearly you should be able to have that. Um, if they're saying, oh, just the textbook and your notes, you, you probably should clarify if practice answers you've written um, count as that. Um, yeah, and you know, you're not gonna have time to look things up. So, you know, just kind of treat it as you as you prepare, treat it as if it was any other essay short answer exam. Um, because, you know, if you're thinking, I, I don't have to remember anything, then you're going to run out of time. Um, so plagiarism, getting back to Academic Integrity Week, that can be an issue um, with open book or like any type of essay exams, but especially open book. So for essay exams in general, you should clarify whether the professor is expecting you to provide citations. Um, I think if you're writing from memory, it would be you know, very ridiculous if the professor wanted citations, but um, just make sure. And on an open book, sometimes they will want citations, you know, if they know that you're gonna have your materials in front of you and, you know, and, and you're gonna be drawing on them, they might want it, but they might not because they realize that it's under time pressure. Um, so that should be something that you clarify and, uh, you know, and you just like, if you look something up, you do not copy it word for word out of the book, um, because that is plagiarism still. Um, and yeah, so you just, you want to know what materials you're allowed and then make it really easy to find things in your materials. So I've written open book exams before and um, the picture on the right with, you know, the highlighters and the tabs, um, that really indicates what my books looked like, you know, and even my notes. Uh, I tab my notes to be able to easily find something. Um, and I actually wrote on the tabs, like I wrote a keyword indicating what can be found in that in that section. Um, because probably you will have to look up the odd thing uh, and you don't wanna waste a bunch of time doing that. So, I, you know, I made like really good annotations of my notes. Sometimes I wrote a summary, um, you know, kind of, of, of the whole course. Uh, and, you know, and I, and I was hoping that if I had to look something up, I could look it up in the summary rather than having to look it up in the whole big textbook. Um, you know, that can be really time consuming, so it might not be necessary, but, you know, and know like all your indexes, you know, like have a tab for your index, your table of contents, um, you know, and know how to, how to navigate those really well. Um, and, you know, and also like summaries can be reduced to like a concept map showing relationships between different parts of the course, um, a comparison chart if it's if it's something like a literature course where you're supposed to be comparing different works of literature like the example given or a theory course, you know, it, it and, and I would say even for like a closed book exam. Um, for those kind of courses, it's good to make a comparison chart to help you learn. Um, you know, so putting like the theorists on one dimension and the different aspects of the theories on the other, you know, can just be a really valuable quick reference if it's an open book test. Um, take home exams, you know, any sort of an online exam is really a take home exam, but what that term has traditionally referred to is, you know, where it's open book and you're given several days to do it. And a lot of that is about planning out your time, you know, so if you know that you're going to have like three days to write a whole exam. Um, you probably don't want to be working on two of those three days, you know, like you want to clear your schedule in advance um, and figure out like where are you going to be most productive to do the work and uh, what your days are going to look like. So when I had a three day exam, um, I set myself up in the library, um, in a computer lab, like where my friends didn't really go so much so that they wouldn't be distracting me um and i went there like every day from about probably 9 30 or 10 in the morning um and i took a lunch break and i took a bit of a walk and i would wind up at about i don't know 5 5 30 um every evening and then in the evenings i would spend some time with my family and wind down and get a really solid sleep and then come back and, you know, so I did that, I think, on the, the last day 
uh, I was able to finish at like 2.30 or something, you know, so, so yeah, like it's not something where you're supposed to, you know, I don't think it's good practice to try to sit there for like really long, long days and nights. Um, and at the same time, it's not a good practice to like have to immediately block off a big chunk of that time for other things that you have to do. Um, so in conclusion, I just, you know, wanted to tie this workshop to Academic Integrity Week. And um, there actually is a board called International Center for Academic Integrity. And in the early days of the pandemic, one of the board members said this, pressure and stress are key drivers, drivers of cheating behaviors and students today are experiencing a lot of both. You know, and I think that's still the case even when we're out of remote learning. Um, so students who feel connected, supported, and encouraged are less likely to cheat. So that's, you know, that's really what the Student Learning Commons is there for. That's why we're doing this. Um, and uh, also, I encourage you to take care of other sources of support, like uh, going to your professors or TAs if you have any questions um, leading up to the exam, like if you're, you know, really having trouble understanding a part of it or if you want to know more about their expectations and you know what the exam is going to be like seek support uh, and that can be very useful um, so this is the student learning commons uh, main page i think you've you've both been here to sign up for the workshop so you would have gone to this find a workshop page um, to sign up if you scroll all the way down on that then you are going to get to the recorded a link to the recorded workshops page and that's where i will be placing this recording especially for maggie who um, missed a good part of it you can watch it um, and then also this orange learning and studying tile here um, contains like if you if you go to links that are under there for like exam preparation exam anxiety strategies for different types of exams like you know there's a lot more information you can access there. Um, you are you have eligibility to um, get credit on your co curricular record for this workshop. Um, so if you wanted to take a screenshot and do this web survey and you know what it just occurred to me that this web survey link may or may not be up to date uh, and I apologize if it isn't but there is a link off both the workshops page uh, on the website that I just showed you um, and also on the recorded workshops page to the correct link to fill out the uh, the web survey so that you can get credit on your co-curricular record, which is like a transcript, um, but it's a transcript for things other than coursework that you've done at SFU. Um, so I, I would love to see in the chat, uh, you know, what your biggest takeaway or couple of takeaways um, are from this workshop. Like, what are you planning to try? And also, um, as well as what you're planning to try, if you have any questions at this time, I'm here to answer them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Brianna, with your quantitative exam, um, you're, you're going to like work your way through your difficult problems. Yeah. And, and, you know, that should make it so much easier, even if it's a different difficult problem that you get on the exam, um, you'll at least like know the process for going through and not panic. Um, yeah, and pre-read the short answer questions so that you have them in your head as you go through the rest. Um, and also like if you can make any choices, making the choices right away. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that is it, but I'll turn off the recording and um, I'm willing to stay if anybody wants to talk to me further. So thank you.